Um, I'd like to. I'd like to introduce um, Michelle Nall, our speaker this morning for the first session, along with her co-authors, Heidi Bunk and Amy Kretlow. All three work for the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources, where Michelle is a statewide lake and reservoir ecologist, Heidi is a lakes biologist, and Amy is aquatic invasive species response and pathways specialist. Together, they will be speaking on the topic of monitoring and managing of starry stonework. Nitalopsis obtusa in Wisconsin lakes. They'll have about 30 minutes for their presentation and will then address questions. So please, um, if you have questions for them, type them into the Q&A section, not the chat, but the Q&A section and upvote the questions that you want answered. Um, we also um, ask that if you have a question for a specific speaker today, be sure to put that in your question. This is a question for Michelle, for example. And with that, I'm going to hand the virtual microphone over to Michelle. All right, thank you very much, Joe. Um, and thanks everyone for tuning in this morning on the second full day of Wisconsin Water Week. Um, I just want to acknowledge my co-authors one more time, Heidi Bunk and Amy Kretlow, uh, both work in the southeast part of the state for the Wisconsin DNR. And they were um, very integral in a lot of the data and information that you're going to see in this presentation today. Hey guys, I'm going to jump in because the live stream is not coming through. So I think the credentials for live streaming might be incorrect. Um, Bill, you'd have to change those in the more tab. I'm still not seeing any live stream on the other computer. It's, so in your controls on the more uh, down by the mute and record and reactions and all that stuff, there should be three dots and you can choose the live streaming credentials. And those are posted within that session spreadsheet. Um, I'll pull them up here in a sec. Uh, hmm, it's saying it's live streaming. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's just streaming to the wrong place. <laughs> So instead of going to the correct session, I think it's going somewhere else. If you want, I can put, I can post those in the chat and you can take them one, one at a time and put them into the live stream fields. Okay. And then we'll just redo it. Sarah, were you seeing any streaming coming through? Nope. Okay. So the first one is probably correct. It's the second and the third field that you'll need to redo. So put this in the second field, if you see that in the chat. And, and I'll put the third one in. That one would be copied and pasted into the third live streaming field. If you, if you, are you able to get to those? Yep. And then save those again. And then let's see if, if you can start live streaming and we'll see if it goes to the right place. Here it comes. All right, we're looking good now. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this morning's session on aquatic invasive species. Uh, this session is being recorded. Um, my name is Joe Lattimore. I'm from Michigan State University and excited to be part of Wisconsin Water Week. Our first speaker this morning will be Michelle Nall from the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. Um, she's joined by her co-authors, Heidi Bunk and Amy Kretlow. All three are at the Wisconsin DNR, and they will be presenting on the topic of monitoring and management of starry stonewort in Wisconsin lakes. They'll have about 30 minutes for their presentation, and while they're speaking, feel free to post any questions for them in the Q&A box, not the chat box, the Q&A box, um, and indicate who the question is for. Um, with that, I'll hand it over to Michelle. All right, 
Thanks, Joe. Um, I appreciate everyone um, hanging in there as we dealt with a quick technical difficulty. Um, so yes, I'm Michelle Nault. I'm the statewide lakes and reservoir ecologist for the Wisconsin DNR. And I want to acknowledge, um, again, my two co-authors, Heidi Bunk and Amy Kretlow, also DNR employees that work in the southeast part of the state. Um, and we're very integral in getting a lot of the data and information that I'm going to present to you guys today. So just a little bit of background on what starry stonewort is. Um, starry stonewort is a macroalgae species. So it's a little bit different than many of our true vascular plants. It's originally native to Europe and Asia, and it's actually quite rare in portions of its native range. However, it was first documented in the United States in the 1970s, and it was likely inadvertently introduced to the US via international ballast water with it first appearing in the St. Lawrence River. It's able to survive a wide range of habitats and it primarily reproduces via these unique asexual bulbils that you can see in the bottom right corner. The ecological impacts of the species are largely unknown. And so much of what we're trying to do is to better understand what impacts this new invader might have on our Wisconsin lakes. A couple of quick identification tips before we get moving here. Um, on the left, there's a picture of starry stonewort. And then on the right are three pictures of native lookalike species. And so compared to some of our native Caras and Nutellas, starry stonewort is, is much larger and more robust. The whirls of the leaves are, are a lot longer than with our native uh, Cara and Nutella species. And perhaps the most unique distinguishing characteristic of starry stonewort is the star-shaped bulbils that it produces. And this is how it primarily reproduces. So on the left, you'll see a, a photo of a plant that was dislodged from the ground. And those tiny white dots are magnified on the right. And you'll see a, a very distinct star-shaped bulbul, which is a key identifying characteristic of this new aquatic invasive plant. In terms of rage inspection, it's been found throughout the northeastern part of the US, as well as parts of the, new, of the Midwest, um, primarily found in Michigan with several um, about you know several hundred lakes now having starry stonework confirmed in the state. More recently, it was found in Wisconsin in 2015 and followed by Michigan soon after, or excuse me, Wisconsin in 2014 and followed by Michigan soon after in 2015. And it's currently known from several Midwest states as well as parts of Canada. And the number of reported starry stonewort populations has um, significantly increased over time and particularly in the last decade or so. This is a graph that was taken from a recent article published in Aquatic Bot Botany by Dan Larkin. And you'll see that um, from the initial detection in the 1970s up until the mid 2000s, really there weren't very many populations of starry stonewort that were detected and reported. However, in the last decade or so, we can see that the, both the number of confirmed populations, which have been verified via a taxonomic expert, and the number of total reported populations have significantly increased. And so for Wisconsin, our first discovery of starry stonewort occurred back in September of 2014, when some of our staff were out conducting a relatively routine aquatic plant point intercept survey out on Little Muskego Lake in Waukesha County. Uh, this uh, population was suspected to be starry stonewort at the time of discovery, but it was also verified by other DNR staff as well as experts from the New York Botanical Garden, seeing that this was the first population of starry stonewort found in our state. This detection triggered a rapid assessment monitoring, which occurred in lakes surrounding the initial detection in southeast Wisconsin. And this monitoring consisted of a variety of different methods, including rake tosses at boat launches, shoreline meander surveys, underwater snorkeling, as well as full lake-wide aquatic invasive species early detection surveys. There were some efforts made to try to prioritize serving lakes that had appropriate characteristics for starry stonework growth. Um, and primarily this was the presence of other native Kara species as well as water hardness. We also have a very robust aquatic invasive species statewide program in Wisconsin. And so this new discovery really raised some heightened outreach and awareness about this new species. And so when staff in other areas of the state were out doing their aquatic invasive species surveys and also their aquatic plant point intercept surveys, 
they were very aware that this new species had been found and they were um, on the lookout for it. And so that leads us to date. Um, since the initial finding in 2014, we are currently up to 14 inland water bodies in Wisconsin where starry stonewort has been verified. The starry stonewort has also been verified along coastal portions of both Green Bay and Lake Michigan. Um, our most recent efforts in 2020, uh, despite the challenges that COVID uh, threw at us, um, DNR staff and some partners were able to go out and, and uh, implement a pretty significant effort for monitoring starry stonewort, primarily in the central part of the state to follow up on some newer discoveries in the last two years that are a little bit disjunct from some other populations that had previously been more restricted to the southeast part of the state. And so in these 14 water bodies where we have Sarah St Stonewort verified, we've been conducting standardized lakewide aquatic plant surveys in order to collect data on an annual basis. So we can really start to just better understand the impacts of this species on our aquatic plant communities. And so this standard method allows for us to collect some really robust data, which lets us look at a plant community change within a lake over time, and also lets us look at uh, changes amongst different lakes that might have starry stonewort present. The PI method is relatively easy to implement and it provides some really great statistically robust data that's also geolocated. So it also helps you make um, maps to help target your management act actions and activities. And as I mentioned, um, we not only collect uh, data on starry stonework presence, but also on all the other native plants which are part of the uh, plant community. And so here's an example of a starry stonewort uh, um, map that was created based upon a point intercept survey. So on the left is the basic point intercept grid for Little Muskego Lake. And then on the right is the distribution of starry stonewort um, after the first year that we surveyed the water body. And you'll see that these red stars in this one bay indicate that originally the starry stonewort was very localized out on this water body. And that really helped us to target our management actions in the specific uh, area of the lake. And so, as I mentioned, we've been collecting this lake wide point intercept data on all the water bodies with starry stonewort. And so this graph displays the data that we've collected to date. On the bottom, we have the year starting in 2014 and going up to our most recent surveys in 2020. And then on the vertical axis, we have the littoral frequency of occurrence of starry stonewort. So this is a metric that basically tells you how abundant starry stonewort is in the area of a lake where plants are able to grow. And you'll notice that um, we have some different patterns in starry stonewort frequency observed over time across these different water bodies. We have some lakes, um, for example, like Little Muskego and Long Lake, where the trend in starry stonewort over time has been increasing with more abundant starry stonewort observed as the years progress. However, we also have lakes such as Pike Lake where the amount of starry stonewort has actually been decreasing over time. And then we have other patterns in uh, lakes like silver and green and little cedar, where the starry stonewort has remained relatively stable over time and hasn't really increased or decreased. And so the department continues to um, collaborate with partners so that we can um, continue to collect this very important data on these trends over time in these water bodies to better understand potential impacts. Another thing the point intercept data allows us to do is to look at where starry stonewort occurs in lakes by water depth. And so this graph looks at varying water depths on the bottom on the X axis and then the number of unique sites where starry stonewort was found on the vertical Y axis. And you'll notice that most of the starry stonewort that we found in our invaded lakes are found in relatively shallow waters, primarily between two to six feet deep. Although starry stonewort is able to grow out at deeper depths with our deeper, uh, deepest depth to date being found out at 28 feet. But primarily it does like to colonize more in those shallower near shore areas. Another thing that we've just started to explore is what the potential impacts of starry stonewort might be on some of our beneficial native aquatic plants. And so this is a graph that looks at the number of average native species found at each individual survey site 
over time for the lakes where we had at least three years worth of data. And similar to what we saw in the trends in starry stonewort frequency, we also see some differences in the potential impacts on native plants. We have some lakes where the overall trend illustrated by the dashed blue line is decreasing over time, suggesting that starry stonewort and other invasive species may be having a negative impact. However, we also have lakes that are exhibiting either no change in um, the overall trend in average number of native species, or even increasing trends in the average number of natives. And again, we'll continue to collect some data and expand upon this to better understand what impacts uh, starry stonewort might have on our native species. And then finally, for the second half of this presentation, I'm gonna focus a little bit more on some of the specific implementation efforts that we've done to try to control starry stonewort. Um, the department ever since starry stonewort was first found in 2014 has uh, worked with partners in an attempt to try a variety of different techniques um, on, on trying to control starry stonewort. Um, there really wasn't much in the published literature or from talking with other resource managers on things that had actually been proven to be effective for starry stonewort. And so some of the techniques that we've tried to date include uh, chemical treatments, both in open water scenarios, as well as utilizing limno barrier curtains. We've also utilized a winter drawdown, diver assisted suction harvesting and hand removal, we have at least one lake that has implemented dash, or excuse me, dredging, and then also um, no management, no active management, but just monitoring the population over time. And so this is the same frequency of occurrence graph that I showed for starry stonewort uh, a couple minutes ago, but now I've overlaid all the various management techniques that have been implemented for starry stonewort control over the past couple of years. So the red dashed lines indicate herbicide treatments, which have occurred in an attempt to control starry stonewort, primarily based with copper and endothole products. But we've also have some lakes that have utilized dash and hand pulling indicated by the bluer lines, drawdown indicated by the green line, as well as dredging. And so primarily most of our management to date has been focused on using chemical herbicides, but um, more integrated techniques are being used on some water bodies as well. And so what I would like to do is just highlight uh, two of these case studies in a little bit more detail. Um, I, I don't have time to get into all the individual uh, nitty gritty details for all the lakes, um, but I will mention that we do have a starry stonewort fact sheet available on our DNR website that um, you can reference that has some of those figures and graphs that I presented earlier, if you'd like a little bit more detail. And so the two case studies I'd like to highlight um, with the rest of my time this morning are Green Lake in Washington County, as well as Okachi Lake in Waukesha County. And both of these uh, Starry Stonewart projects utilized a relatively small scale treatment um, that used a chemical combination that was applied within a physical limno barrier curtain to try to hold that herbicide on site and allow for sufficient contact exposure time to hopefully actually kill starry stonewort and achieve our management goals. And so Green Lake is a 70 acre seepage lake. Um, it's about 40 feet max depth and starry stonewort was first found in 2016 at a relatively localized area near one of the two public boat access locations on the water body. This lake happens to fall within the Great Lakes Basin. And so they were able to work um, with partners and DNR staff to uh, obtain funding through the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative to help support some of the monitoring and control efforts that were implemented out here. And again, specifically, this was a herbicide treatment which was applied um, in about a one acre area. Um, you can see some aerial photos here of the boat launch and then the barrier schematics, as well as the barrier curtain being um, placed out on the water body. There was two treatments that occurred. The first one happened in September of 2018, and then the follow-up treatment happened in June of 2019. And the chemical combination utilized was a mixture of Qtrine Ultra, which is a copper product, and Hydrothal 191. 
the way that we monitored uh, these projects was that we um, had a, a point intercept grid developed specifically for the area that we were targeting for treatment. And we also monitored water samples after treatment in order to uh, determine how much herbicide product was remaining in the water column um, following treatment to help us better understand the efficacy data that we collected. And then we collected the pre and post plant surveys, um, both prior to treatment and immediately after treatment in both uh, 2018 and 2019, as well as in 2020. So first I'll talk about the herbicide concentration results for Green Lake. Um, both of these figures are looking at the 2018 and then the 2019 results for copper. On the bottom axis, we have the number of days after treatment and then on the vertical y-axis, we have the concentration of copper, which was observed. The red horizontal line indicates the target rate, what the applicators were aiming to achieve with this treatment. And then the various lines indicate the monitoring stations, both within the barrier and then also outside the barrier. And so what we'll see from this data is that in both years, the herbicide was able to hit the target concentration and out um, for several days after treatment, the herbicide concentration was maintained, ultimately until the barrier was removed. Um, the sites outside of the barrier um, at the bottom here did not exhibit much herbicide um, leakage. And so the barrier uh, did its job basically of keeping that herbicide where we wanted it to be, allowing for the plants to be exposed to that herbicide for as long as possible. Um, these are very similar graphs, um, but these are the results for endothol instead of copper. Again, good uh, hitting of the target rate and not very uh, much herbicide seen outside of the barrier curtain. And so how did this translate into our efficacy for starry stonewort? Um, these are two graphs for 2018 and 2019. The blue line indicates the percent of starry stonewort frequency. So this is the presence absence data. Um, and that uh, axis is over here. And then the green bars indicate the average rake fullness rating. This is a surrogate for how much biomass or how much plant material is physically there at the site. And um, those rake fullness ratings are given on a scale of zero to three um, with three being the most abundant. The red vertical lines indicate when the um, herbicide treatment occurred. And so we'll see in 2018, um, prior to treatment, starry stonewort frequency was about 21%. And following treatment, starry stone frequency was still at about 21%. So the treatment unfortunately did not uh, achieve our goal of reducing starry stonewort in that treatment area. And similar results were seen in 2019 where again, um, starry stonewort was relatively low when the treatment occurred, but by the last sampling event in August, it had uh, rebounded back to um, relatively high levels. And so finally, I'm gonna transition quickly into Okachi Lake so I can get a minute or two for questions. Um, Okachi Lake is a much larger lake um, with a similar scenario where starry stonewort was found near a, a localized boat access area. There was also a small population detected near a bridge on the lake. And so this allowed for a unique opportunity to manage one of the sites while simultaneously monitoring the other site as an untreated reference area. And this lake group worked with DNR to apply for some early detection and response grant funds to help support the monitoring and control efforts out here. Again, this was a chemical control application within a limno barrier. Um, this was about a half an acre treatment that happened in mid-July, and the chemical combination utilized was Nautique with Hydrothal-191. And the specific reason this chemical combination was utilized was based on some research that the U.S. Army Corps had indicated that this might be a, a good combination to try in order to not only kill the vegetative part of starry stonewort, but also to kill the underground bulbuls. Very similar to Green Lake, we did uh, both pre and post uh, surveys for aquatic plants, as well as collected the herbicide concentration monitoring within the barrier curtain and outside the curtain. And as I indicated, we did our plant monitoring both within the treated area and as well as in an untreated reference area. 
Very similar to what we saw out on Green Lake, our herbicide concentration monitoring indicated that we were able to hit the target concentrations that we were aiming for. Um, and the blue line at the bottom of both these graphs indicate the site outside the treatment area. And again, we saw very little herbicide leakage outside with that herbicide product staying where we wanted it to be. Michelle, you have about four minutes left. Great, thank you. Um, and so um, getting on to the plant data here, um, again, unfortunately, very similar results that we saw with Green Lake, even though we utilized a different chemical combination. Pre and post treatment, we did not see any significant change in starry stonewort frequency. Um, and when we look at our untreated reference lake, basically the same patterns that we saw in both frequency and in the biomass was observed in both the site we treated and the site we didn't treat. And so just to kind of wrap things up, um, our data to date indicates that, you know, the starry stoneware populations that we've been monitoring has showed a very wide range of invasion trajectories over time and really some mixed effects on native plant communities. And so we'll continue to collect and analyze this data in order to really increase our understanding of what the potential impacts of this new invasive species might actually be on Wisconsin lakes. Um, to date, some of our pre and post treatment data um, on these lakes that have primarily used chemical control methods really hasn't resulted in effective control. And so we're continuing to look at monitoring other non-chemical management techniques, potentially other chemical combinations in the future to try to figure out something that, that will work to hopefully control starry stonewort. And we're not doing this alone. Um, we're working with many other regional and national partners, um, the US Army Corps, University of Minnesota, University of Indiana. Um, we're also active members of the Great Lakes Starry Stonework Collaborative. And so hopefully we'll continue to evaluate techniques and work together to better understand how to manage the species in the future. And with that, I will have um, a couple minutes to take any questions that might be there. Uh, thanks again to all my um, partners and uh, here's our emails if you'd like to contact us. Thanks again. Thanks, Michelle. Um, we do have a couple minutes left for questions. Um, one that's come in, I'll read to you. Is there any idea of why Starry Stonewort in Pike Lake has declined with no management? I feel that if we could figure out the factors that are causing the decline, we could better understand how to manage it in other lakes. This could be an area of study. Yeah, that's that's a great question. Um, you know, Pike Lake is one that definitely is is very interesting to us, um, given that the starry stonework frequency has declined over time. Um, Pike Lake is actually a lake that does no active management at all for invasive species. Um, it has Eurasian water milfoil. It has zebra mussels. It clearly has starry, and so. Um, you know, perhaps just the disturbance of management might give Starry Stonewort an ability to, uh, you know, take off in some of these lakes where in other lakes that, you know, perhaps are not being actively managed, it's able to integrate into the community a little bit better. Um, but that'll be one we definitely continue to watch over time. Thanks, Michelle. And, and one more question. Um, what if a, a person thinks they've found Starry Stonewort in a Wisconsin lake? What should they do? Great. Uh, well, yeah, that's great that, you know, citizens are out there looking for this. Um, if you do think you found starry stonewort, the best route would be to contact your regional DNR aquatic invasive species coordinator. Um, all of those contact information can be found on our DNR website. Um, and so if you happen to find it in the southeast part of the state, um, Amy Kretlow would be your local contact there. Um, it's really great if you can collect a specimen of starry stonewort, so actually grab some and stick it in a Ziploc bag with a little bit of water. Um, pictures are always uh, welcome as well, but um, some of the characteristics we're looking for starry stonewort are, are pretty tiny. Um, this bulbul here is, is no bigger than the size of a fingernail, so, um, so that would be the best way, and then we can work with you to verify if it's starry stonewort or perhaps one of our native uh, Caraluca-like species. All right, thanks again, Michelle, and to your co-authors, Amy and Heidi, um, for sharing this work you're doing on starry stonewort. And with that, we're gonna move on to our next set of presentations. So 